gentlemen, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Is there any more classic system? For many, the NES was their very first gaming console and holds a special place in their hearts. For many, the SKS was the very first centerfire rifle they ever owned and holds a very special place in their hearts. For me, I got lucky and barely got in on the tail end of the SKS craze. The SKS was first manufactured in 1945 and was immediately obsolete upon its manufacture. But it got a second lease on life on the civilian market. It was a cheap and highly dependable rifle and could be had at one time for 140 USD. In fact, when it came time for me to get my first centerfire rifle, it was at the top of the list. So here's the question. It is now 2018. Is it still relevant? This is a Serbian SKS model 5966 and I acquired it for the princely sum of 140 USD back in 2007 when I turned 18. It was in its original configuration and came with a sling that is still on the rifle, 20 stripper clips and a stripper clip pouch. A good deal to say the least. Over the years, I have upgraded it in various ways, and one of the ways to determine a rifle's relevancy is by looking at its aftermarket parts availability. At the time I acquired it, and for many years afterward, you could get a wide variety of stocks and other add-ons and attachments. My first upgrade was fairly simple. I sanded the magwell on the woodstock until it could accept high cap mags. Eventually, I bought a folding ATI stock and removed the grenade launcher slash muzzle brake along with the bayonet, thinking that they were irrelevant. For a number of years, I had the SKS in this configuration until one day I decided to take the rifle entirely back to its stock form, which it remained in for about a year. Finally, I decided to fully modernize it while leaving much of it unchanged. What may not be readily obvious is the fact that most of the small parts have been upgraded with new manufactured US components. The gas piston, the recoil spring, and even the little spring that holds in the trigger group have been upgraded. The most obvious change is the stock. And this is one of the more, shall we say, contentious changes. This is a Tapco Interfuse stock, and if you've never heard of it before, you would likely think it's a great looking stock, and if you had one yourself, you would likely think it was a great feeling and high quality stock. But if you frequent gun forums, well apparently this stock, like so many things, just blows up and is Crapco. And also, apparently Tapco mags are Jamamatic. The reality is so different that I think many of these forum Dinsians have never even seen a gun, much less tried to upgrade theirs. The thing about both the Tapco stock and mag is the fact that you need basic competency to use both. And this is something that is sadly in very short supply no matter what era you're talking about. The Tapco mags require proper seating to function, just like any other mag, and yet people either forget this or do not know. The Tapco stock must first be fit to the rifle before the rifle can be mated to it. What does that mean? Well, each SKS is slightly different from one another, and Tapco ships the stock kits to be filed to fit each version of the SKS. When you file the stock down, you must take care not to file away too much material. The same holds true for the gas tube cover. I saw so many posts stating that it cannot hold zero. The reality is a bit different. If you file it properly, it will hold zero. Before going to the range to record this video, I had the rifle propped up by the desk while I was writing the script, only to have it slide down and off the desk. I reached to grab the bloody thing only to miss, and it hit the floor. Upon taking it to the range, there was no change in point of aim. It would seem that I filed it properly. The Tapco stock is simply excellent and is an essential upgrade for any SKS. It lightens the rifle considerably and makes it slightly more comfortable to shoot. When I first bought the SKS, I was surprised as to how fun it was to shoot in its base configuration. With the Tapco stock, it's even more fun to shoot as the already minimal recoil is dampened to almost 22 levels of non-existence.
Moving on, we have the Red Dot Optic. There have been numerous optic mounts produced for the SKS, and I feel that the Tapco one is perhaps not the best, but one of the best. As it allows you to mount the optic in a scout configuration, meaning it's mounted in a far forward position. For me at least, I can pick up the dot quick and easy. And for me, the red dot makes getting good hits far easier than with iron sights. I shoot with the wrong eye, like quite a few YouTubers it seems. With a red dot optic, it does not matter what eye you use, and thus I don't have to worry about compensating for shooting with the wrong eye. This red dot optic is a UTG red dot, and was bought for a very low price off of eBay. I figured I would get a cheap optic and use it until I could get a better one. But I won the Chinese lottery and thus I got a really, really good cheap optic. It has stood up to numerous shooting sessions and a trip to the ground. My only complaint is the fact that the dot is a bit weak, especially when compared to my still low cost BSA red dot on my AR. I actually wouldn't recommend this red dot these days though, because when I picked up one from my AR, the dot was even weaker to the point where it was invisible in the daylight. So it would seem that the Chinese are cheaping out even more than they usually do. If you want to get an inexpensive optic, I would suggest acquiring a BSA red dot as they are still cheap and are fairly well made, at least for now. When I upgraded it this final time, I returned the original grenade launcher slash muzzle brake onto the rifle. It didn't add that much weight and I wanted a muzzle brake on the rifle and this works quite well in limiting muzzle rise. The bayonet, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing short of essential. An SKS shorn of its most distinctive feature just isn't an SKS, and its machine spirit gets all depressed and starts listening to Linkin Park. The Tapco stocks come in two configurations, one with a bayonet cut and one without. And I figured that if this was going to be the final upgrade for the SKS, I would just have to add the bayonet back onto the rifle so that it would be complete, as bayonetless SKSs just look like they are missing something. The bayonet does make the rifle a little front heavy, but it does help further mitigate muzzle rise. And some speedrun ARs literally have weights on the front end to do the same thing. And let's face it, the bayonet, both in 2007 and today, has always been a great crowd pleaser. Whenever I show people the SKS, they were always impressed by it. What can I say? I guess some people just love a knife on a rifle. It just makes it look mean. And here we come to the 10 round, non-detachable box magazine. The first question on everyone's mind is this. If you destroyed the SKS this much, why not go all out and use detachable magazines? Well, simple math and economics is the reason. And I really don't get why people hate it when gun owners upgrade their rifles. There are plenty of SKS rifles in museums! If I want to upgrade my rifle, that's not going to hurt anything or anyone. I stuck with the 10 round mag due to the fact that clips are cheap and mags are not. Just like the many militaries back in the early to mid 20th century. You see, producing or buying a bunch of metal clips is way cheaper than producing or buying a bunch of magazines. Case in point, the Tapco 20 round mag is by far the best magazine for the rifle as it's quite durable and engages the bolt hold open mechanism. Said mechanism actually puts the SKS slightly ahead of the AKS series of rifles in terms of usability. The Tapco mag is 20 USD. 20 10 round stripper clips cost about 10 USD. You see where I'm going with this. I could spend $200 on mags to carry 200 rounds, or I could spend $10 on 20 stripper clips and save all that money and use it on ammo and just reload my rifle 10 rounds at a time. Stripper clips are often maligned by people that either A, have never used them, or B, are gun snobs. You can reload this rifle quite quickly with clips, and when you get them out of mag pouches, if you have loaded the clip properly, you will not lose rounds. You can, of course, botch reloads if you don't have enough practice, but you can also botch reloads with magazines if you are not careful. You know, like that one time I forgot to give my AR mag a good slap, fired one round and then the mag fell out. That was most embarrassing indeed. 
but it happens to the best of us, and blaming the gun will not help you get better. Back in 2007, stripper clips were a great way of stockpiling reloads, and in 2018, they still are, as mags for many rifles are not cheap. And don't even get me started on the cost of pistol mags! Ergonomics-wise, the rifle is also quite excellent as well. The safety is easy to toggle on and off, and if you do have a stoppage, it is quite easy to open up the mag to drop out defective rounds. Overall, for the novice to advanced shooter, the SKS is nothing short of excellent. With a lighter stock and a red dot, the SKS can functionally hold its own in the modern era. I shall pose the a question. Is this a tactical rifle? It's got an evil black stock and an even more evil red dot. Does adding both of these things make this rifle tactical in some way? Well, here's another question. Here is my tack strip clip pow. I removed the ch to make it more high-speed, low-drag. Is this black stripper clip pouch any more tactical than a brown leather one? Well, if you have any sanity at all, the answer is no. Just adding a lighter stock and an optic does not a super rifle create. Any more than dyeing a brown leather stripper clip pouch does not a tack strip clip pow create either. When people talk about tactical this and tactical that, they really have no clue or idea what that actually means. The AR-15 is also not a tactical rifle in any way. It's a semi-auto rifle, just like the SKS. The difference between the AR and this is the fact that the AR shoots a different caliber and it can take high cap mags. Oh dear, ladies and gentlemen, could the media have been resorting to the old yellow journalism? Well now let's move on and take a look at the ammo this noble beast utilizes. This is the classic 7.62x39 mm round, first designed way back in 1944. Specifically, this is a Wolf branded 123 grained polyformant round. I have been using Wolf branded ammo since 2007 and it has been 100% reliable up until today. This is a Gold Tiger 124 grain round, and I have never used any until today, and it generally functioned well, although like with the Wolf, I had some bad neck crimps, and thus had some malfunctions. That is one thing to keep in mind when shooting any firearm. The ammo may be the culprit when it comes to malfunctions and not the gun itself. The first time I shot my Ruger new model Super Blackhawk, I bought some CCI aluminum cased 44 specials. About 10 out of a box of 50 worked. It was not the gun's fault, it was the rather crappy ammo. Wolf is generally not crappy, but it seems from this shooting session at least that some of it can be. However, when millions upon millions of rounds are manufactured every single day, there is a good chance of winning the Russian lottery and getting a crap box. The days of buying surplus military ammo for cheap are long over, but you can find some surplus Yugo ammo now and again. But remember that said ammo is corrosive, meaning that unless you clean your firearm properly, your rifle may be visited by the rather fearsome rust monster. I have shot a little bit of the corrosive Yugo ammo and it functioned well, but I personally still use Wolf even if it is sadly not as reliable as it once was. Today I will be shooting 70 rounds. 30 at the 50 and 40 at the 100. And it's going to be a mixture of Wolf Polyformance and Gold Tiger. And to maximize accuracy, all shooting will be done from the bench. So now, let's head out and have some fun.
as you can see, both the rifle and the ammo is quite accurate and consistent in its accuracy. This rain session was the first time I ever had any bad wolf ammo, but despite there being a few defective rounds, the rounds were not defective in their accuracy. And as you could see, sometimes one can indeed be a fumble fingers when reloading with stripper clips. I have no idea why the last rounds on the gold tiger clips wouldn't strip off. The clips themselves appeared to be fine. It's just one of those things that happens on the clock or when the camera is rolling. Now, let's head to the 100 yard line and see if we can do even better. Hand to the right. Need to slow that a little bit. Looks like some of them are hitting down around 5 o'clock. Let me put it this way. I can barely see that target, so I'm happy to just hit it. Well, you're keeping them. They're all in the green up there. in the bullseye and the rest of them just kind of scattered around. Oh, I think I tried to get that in. No malfunctions of the operator this time, and we had only one dud primer when Gramps shot the rifle. Sadly, Wolf must be cheaping out on its primers because I've been getting dud primers with my Wolf gold ammo as well. But 
Ammo annoyances aside, that is some damn good shooting if I do say so myself. Oh, I know that many a YouTuber will get better groupings than this, but for me, I am most pleased with myself, for I cannot really see the target, and to me, it just looks like a bright white rectangle, so I almost have to guess where the bloody bull is. And well, damn son, five in the bull. To put that in perspective, I was able to put five shots into a circle three inches in diameter. Not too shabby if I do say so myself. So yeah, I would say that the SKS is quite an accurate rifle indeed. So, after talking up the SKS for the entire video, is it still even remotely relevant in today's brave new world? It is, sort of. As stated earlier, the SKS was obsolete as a military rifle when it was first adopted. So with that in mind, the SKS was never a relevant military rifle and was already eclipsed at the time by many different designs. If we look at it from the civilian perspective, it was competitive at one time due to its low price and its very large aftermarket parts availability. For many, it was the lowest cost option for a good semi-auto rifle, in general, as they could often be had for less than a bloody 1022. Sadly, in today's world, it is not any one of those things. And in today's world, we must look at it how it really is. It's long and heavy and limited to 10 rounds in its stock configuration. Today the average SKS will run you at least, at least 450 USD. And compared to other rifles in that price bracket, it is irrelevant. For the same price as an SKS, you can build a fairly high quality AR-15. And while AR mags will generally be more than stripper clips, you can still get them for about 8 to 10 USD. So you will not be breaking the bank most of the time at least. Due to dried up supplies and import restrictions, the SKS is now sadly just a collector's rifle. You would only ever get one just to get one for your personal collection. No longer is it the poor man's deer rifle and no more is it a good option for a first rifle. The only way the rifle is relevant is if you already have one or you get blessed by the mighty Tiber Septim and are somehow able to get one for less than 300 USD. The SKS is still relevant in that it is a high quality rifle that is accurate and reliable, but it is no longer an efficient use of one's resources outside of collecting purposes. A shooter looking for a good low cost center fire rifle would be better served by the AR-15. And so, I am General Lutz, wishing you good AR-15 and good AR-10 or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed my review of the SKS rifle, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue bringing you these awesome gun reviews.